Alexander the Great is unquestionably one of the greatest conquerors of the ancient world, so much so that he set the benchmark for many generals that came after him. This is a goal which many generals aim for, but very few come close to actually achieving. Indeed, a majority of his own inner circle of generals failed to even come close to the achievements of their former king. However, from obscurity, one low-ranking commander did just that. This is the story of the meteoric rise of one of Alexander's most successful generals, Seleucus I Nicta. Seleucus himself was born into a rather unimportant noble family in the rising power of Macedon in 358 BC. His father, being a nobleman, was one of King Philip II's generals. However, very little is actually known of him other than his name was Antrochus. Nevertheless, according to Seleucus, he was not just an ordinary son of a minor nobleman. Seleucus claimed that he was no ordinary man, and was in fact a demigod, a son of the god Apollo. Seleucus backed this up by pointing out that the anchor-shaped birthmark on his body was a symbol of the god, a symbol that had apparently been given to his mother by Apollo in the form of a ring. It is believed Seleucus' youth was much like that of every other Macedonian noble child, which involved hunting and studying the new classical Greek way of thinking, something which had been ordered by the then King Philip II in order to unbarbarianize his people to prove that they were more than equal to their classical, educated Greek neighbors, such as Athens and Sparta. His younger adult life was again nothing out of the ordinary, with him joining the Macedonian army. Again though, very little is known of Seleucus' early military career. However, it is known that following Alexander's ascension to the throne of Macedon, he joined the young king in his campaign against the mighty Persian Empire. Again, however, Seleucus goes fairly unmentioned throughout a majority of Alexander's campaigns, being overshadowed by the established companions of Alexander's youth, such as Ptolemy, Cassander, and Perdiccas, as well as old grisly veterans such as Antigonus and Antipater. However, it is clear that he had some faint spark of talent, as by the time of Alexander's campaigns in modern-day Pakistan, he had risen steadily through the ranks, and had even been given command of a Macedonian unit. This Macedonian unit, however, was by no means an ordinary run-of-the-mill military unit. You see, Seleucus was in command of the elite Hypaspists. These were the elite arm of the Macedonian infantry, lightly armoured and extremely mobile. You see, the way the Macedonian army worked was that the main infantry block, called the Phalangites, would hold the enemy in place with their long spears using a military tactic called a phalanx. However, the one problem with a phalanx is that it can only attack and defend from the front, not from the side or from the rear. The Hypaspists were therefore in charge of guarding the flanks, and as such were a vital component of keeping the army's flanks safe when in battle. Seleucus therefore must have had a glimmer of something in his eyes, enough to convince Alexander to promote him to such an important role in the army. Upon Alexander's failed campaigns in Pakistan, he and his army, which by this time was also made up of a large number of Persians, returned back to the new heartland of the Macedonian Empire at Babylon. There, Alexander held banquets and as a whole had a rest from the constant campaignings that they have done since setting out from Macedon all those years ago. One of these banquets took place on a river. During the drunken Macedonian merrymaking, Alexander's crown fell off his head and ended up in the river. Seleucus set out to retrieve the crown, and having found the crown, he supposedly placed it on his head in order to keep it from getting wet. This was despite the fact the crown had already been wet from having fallen in the river. It was not long after this that the great king Alexander fell ill, and after a short illness eventually died in 323 BC. What followed next could be compared to that of vultures descending on a rotten corpse. Alexander's top generals immediately began to carve the late king's empire up among themselves. These generals claimed that they were governors of these satrapies, or provinces, until a clear male heir was apparent. Regency of the empire fell to the general Perdiccas. However, almost immediately, Perdiccas found his authority as regent challenged by another one of Alexander's companions. Ptolemy, the new governor of Egypt, intercepted the tomb of the late king during its return journey to Macedon, stealing the coffin and diverting it towards Alexandria in Egypt. Perdiccas could not allow this challenge to his authority slide, and so he summoned the royal army. Seleucus was one of the generals in the royal army, and as such followed Perdiccas into Ptolemy's territory. However, a river proved to be too much for Perdiccas to handle, effectively blocking the way between his army and Ptolemy's. This blatant incompetence greatly angered the royal army, veterans of many river battles, 
And so, Seleucus, along with a few other generals, murdered Perdiccas, believing he was a lost cause. As a reward for this action, Seleucus was given the governorship of Babylon by the new regent of the empire, the aging Antipater. However, rivalries between Antipater and the veteran phalanx commander Antigonus boiled over, with Antigonus and his son leading a successful campaign against the region, in the process effectively kicking Seleucus out of Babylon. Seleucus found himself once again in Egypt, this time he became a commander in Ptolemy's army against Antigonus. Through some lucky timing, Seleucus along with a small army managed to retake Babylon and in a blitzkrieg campaign took over much of Antigonus's and indeed Alexander's eastern portions of the empire. Around this time, the royal bloodline of Alexander was finally snuffed out, allowing the surviving generals to declare themselves kings over their territories. With Antigonus preoccupied in the west, Seleucus decided to mirror Alexander and invade modern day Pakistan. However, the campaign proved to be just as difficult for Seleucus as it had been for Alexander. Whilst Alexander fought against a scattering of ununified tribes, Seleucus faced the powerhouse of the Morian Empire. This war essentially slowed down into a stalemate, with both sides coming to the negotiating table. Seleucus lost a majority of the former Macedonian holdings in modern day Pakistan. However, as a show of goodwill, he was given 500 war elephants by the Morian king. With the eastern borders secured, Seleucus could turn his attention back to Antigonus. Uniting with the few of Alexander's generals that still lived, Seleucus, Ptolemy, Cassander and Lysimachus finally defeated the now aging Antigonus at the Battle of Ipsus. Seleucus now controlled the largest surface area of the former Macedonian Empire. Much like Alexander, Seleucus became a great city builder, literally stamping his name into the bricks of the nations he ruled over. In memory of his father, Seleucus built the city of Antioch, as well as building the city of Seleucia, with some saying that he moved the populations of Babylon to Seleucia to help give the new city a boost in productivity. Indeed, the organisation of his new territories was a weird mixture of Persian and Greek administrations, with the new empire being split into different satrapies, much like how the Persians had ruled their empire. However, the major difference was that the top offices were held by Greeks. Indeed, the new lands rich due to being positioned on the Fertile Crescent attracted many Greeks from the mainland to the new territories, increasing the Greek population in the area. However, Seleucus was not content with the size of his empire. Seleucus turned his eyes towards his western borders, going to war with his former ally Lysimachus, the king of Thrace in Asia Minor. Within no time, Seleucus had broken through his enemy's defences and was now a stone's throw away from Macedon. He was also by now the only sole surviving general from the time of Alexander's conquest. However, in 281 BC, just as he came within reach of seizing the Macedonian throne, thus becoming the symbolic successor to Alexander, he was assassinated by the son of Ptolemy, thus bringing the meteoric rise of Seleucus to a dramatic and sudden end. With the death of Seleucus, the Macedonian Empire would never again have a chance of being unified under one leader. Being caught up in wars against the Ptolemies, the later Seleucid kings would gradually be worn down by wars, ineptness, political intrigue, civil war, invasions, and finally the power of Rome. Seleucus' story is one of rise from obscurity to fame, but it's also a story of opportunity and knowing when to act decisively at the right time, and one has to wonder what the Greek world would have looked like if he hadn't been killed at the height of his power. Thanks for watching and listening to our video. If you like the channel, consider subscribing to Ancient History Guy. Or, if you really like the channel, head on over to our Patreon feed. There, for as little as $1 a month, you can gain access to exclusive documentaries, behind the scene footage, and videos before they're live on YouTube. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe.